we are going to talk about ultrasound and CT evaluation of gynecolo gynecologic causes of acute pelvic pain in non-pregnant premenopausal patient. So, if a young female patient who's not pregnant comes with an acute pelvic pain, what could that be the cause of this pain? The first step is establishing pregnancy status. Is, it, is she pregnant or is she not pregnant? This will make the differential diagnosis change dramatically. So, young patient who's married, acute pelvic pain, first thing, do a beta SCG level. Is she pregnant or not? Then you decide what to do next. Acute pelvic pain, what's, what does it mean? It means abrupt onset and duration of pain measured in hours or days. Most, m mostly last less than one month, okay? Origin of acute pelvic pain in non-pregnant patient may be either gynecologic, gastrointestinal, or uro urologic. Gynecologic, like pelvic inflammatory disease, functional ovarian cysts, ovarian endometriomas, and adnexial torsion. GI causes, including acute appendicitis, sigmoid diverticulitis, Crohn's, abdominal wall hernia, and epiploic appendicitis, while urologic causes include lower urinary tract infection and urethric calculi. So, we are going to focus on the gynecologic causes, of course, because this is our main concern today. The gynecologic causes include ovarian causes like cysts, whether functional or hemorrhagic, endometriosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, torsion, and neoplasms, which can be malignant or benign. Causes of arising from the uterus includes fibroids, like degeneration or torsion, adenomyosis, cervical stenosis, and extra ovarian and extra uterine causes like ectopic pregnancy, paraovarian cyst, and hydropyosalpics. Let's start with the ovarian disorders. First, this is the ovary. Everyone knows this uh, cycle here that starts, the ovum starts to grow up and under the influence of FSH, then there will be, it will become a mature graphene follicle reaching up to 25 millimeter in diameter under the effect of L uh, LH surge, there will be ovulation and the remaining will change into corpus luteum. This is the normal physiologic cycle. Sometimes during ovulation, there is a transient acute pain called mitral schmerz pain, which is transient physiologic and not significant. Let's talk about functional cysts. Functional or follicular cysts are extremely common. They are physiologic, usually less than five centimeter. They are lined with the granulosa cells and they form when the follicle fails to rupture or regress. Yani, as the follicle grows up, grows up, there will be an LH surge. The follicle will not rupture. It will still intact. It will continue to enlarge. Usually reaches a size of less than five centimeter. Usually it's asymptomatic. Pain may develop because of rapid cystic enlargement, rupture, or hemorrhage. They can be alone or in combination. For example, in this cyst here, you can see this is a looks like a simple cyst. This is the ovary here, okay? This is a functional cyst. The contents are clear. Again, you can see here, this is a, looks like a simple cyst, small in size, less than five centimeter, no soft tissue component, clear internal echoes. If you see internal debris, it might be due to hemorrhage or infection, and it might be the cause of pain. CT scan, showing thin, walled, non-enhancing cyst with the clear contents, clear surrounding fat planes, and the same thing by uh, ultrasound, transvaginal ultrasound, indicating a functional cyst. You need to do a follow-up ultrasound to verify their resolution performed usually within the five to 10 days of the subsequent menstrual cycle. Yani you wait for the next menstrual cycle, then you do the follow-up ultrasound to confirm that it is resolved. Usually they resolve within one or two menstrual cycles. So you tell your patient to come after one or two menstrual cycles within the first five to 10 days and you repeat the ultrasound to confirm its uh, resolution. There's something called corpus luteum cyst or cystic corpus luteum. It's caused by continued growth of the, of the corpus luteum after ovulation, typically with reaching four to six centimeter 
and it's caused local pain and delayed menses for one to two months due to prog progesterone secretion. In the corpus luteum, usually it involutes if there is no pregnancy, okay? If it does not involute, it continues to enlarge, it will result in delayed menstrual cycle for one or two months because it secretes progesterone and may lead to adnexial torsion and severe pain or may rupture causing hemoperitoneum. Most hemorrhagic cysts are corpus luteum cysts that have bled internal. So if you see a hemorrhagic cyst, they are more in favor of a corpus luteum cyst rather than functional cyst. For example, you can see here, it looks like a thick walled cyst within the adnexia. This is the corpus luteum cyst. The wall are thicker than the follicular cyst and irregular because of the recent rupture. Okay? You can see here, the, by Doppler uh, study, there is a peripheral vascularity within this thick wall, okay? Again, by CT scan, you can see it. it the walls are enhancing, showing post-contrast enhancement uh, with small amount of free fluid indicating corpus luteum cysts. Okay. So, recognition on CT prevent misinterpretation or inappropriate management. For example, someone might say this is an abscess, it's thick walled, it's enhancing, small amount of free fluid in the pelvis, there is pain. Someone might say it's an abscess. You should be careful to remember that there is something called corpus luteum cyst, which appears as thick wall, enhancing wall, sometimes cause pain, small amount of free fluid in the pelvis. This doesn't need any intervention, it resolves by itself usually. Again, you can see here, this ethic enhancing wall in the ovary, it's a corpus luteum cyst. Let's talk about hemorrhagic cysts. They, the appearance depends on the extent of the bleeding, the stage at imaging. Can be smooth unilocular, filled with cyst with, filled with low level echoes, can be septated cyst, can, be, can appear as a cyst containing organized blood, may simulate solid mass, can uh, appear as a cyst containing strands of linear density, it's lace like pattern, bizarre shapes of retracting clots within a cyst. Any of them, in all cases, there should be no internal vascularity. But the walls are vascular. Yeah, you see peripheral vascularity, no internal va vascularity. The septations are avascular. Okay? Sometimes might cause hemoperitoneum with variable degrees, may need transabdominal ultrasound to assess the extent if it is severe. For example, you can see this cyst within the first 24 hour, it appears somewhat like medium level echoes within it. Someone might say this, is, this can be a mass. However, this is a clear follicle or uh, cyst. This is a hemorrhagic cyst. You can see the difference, okay? This is what we call the lace-like pattern or the spider web-like appearance. You can see multiple internal echoes and septations within the hemorrhagic cyst. Okay, this is a magnified view. Th this uh, is hemorrhagic cyst with clot formation. At the beginning, you can see it's like fluid uh, clot level. Like the, we call it uh, yani debris, fluid debris level. Okay? hematocrit level. This is an organized clot. You can see it's peripheral septations and the clot in the center. All of these are different types of hemorrhagic cysts. can appear as any of these types. Uh, there is something, this is the retract retractile clot. The clot can be convex, flat, or concave, according to the which stage you did the ultrasound. This is this is clot and it can be retractile, flat. Okay? For a questionable clot versus mural nodule, is it a mural nodule? Is it a cystic tumor with a mural nodule or is it a hemorrhagic cyst with a clot formation? Roll the patient, turn him to the side, turn, turn her to the side, sorry. Okay? The clot usually moves while the nodule stays in its location in its position. Okay? So you can see this clot moved while this stayed in its location. Okay? The 
nodule usually usually you if you look carefully you will see some internal vascularity where the clot has no internal vascularity however this is not always the rule sometimes there, there is a nodule with no detectable vascularity okay you can see here this is a hemorrhagic cyst and there is absolutely no internal vascularity here or here okay so if no flow in the adherent solid appearing focus obtained follow up in a six week especially if clinical presentation is atypical the clot will change while the blood uh, while the neoplasm has no change yani if you are still in you have not you are not sure whether this is a hemorrhagic cyst with clot formation or is it a cystic tumor with a neural nodule follow up ultrasound after six weeks one and a half month the cyst will change definitely while the tumor will not change if it changes then it's a hemorrhagic cyst usual usually regress might increase in size if there is a replete if it doesn't change this is a tumor cyst rupture it's a common and common cause of pelvic pain and usually presents with acute severe pain plus minus rebound tenderness hypotension with normal white bc count and the patient is afibrile okay uh, you will find sometimes normal ultrasound examination so it's a diagnosis of exclusion because the cyst ruptured everything returns back to normal there is no cyst nothing you should be careful to diagnose it as a diagnosis of exclusion you should be careful you should exclude acute appendicitis ovarian torsion i don't know what abscesses any all of the other causes there remains the ruptured cyst okay you look for the crenated cyst, the collapsed cyst, plus minus internal debris. Usually you see some free fluid and uh, around the ovary in the cul-de-sac and in the Morrison pouch if it is large enough. You can see the free fluid and the crenated cyst here, collapsed cyst. Okay? You can see here there's some free fluid in the cul-de-sac. Again, you can see the ovary looks normal now vascularity of the ovary is normal and there is no sign of a cyst so it's a diagnosis of exclusion this is the crenated cyst you can see here it is collapsed no fluid avascular see the fluid here reaches to the level of the spleen so it's a large one okay so in conclusion, regarding hemorrhagic cysts, there is no Doppler flow except in the wall. There is variable pattern of echogenicity, changes over time, get follow-up, clot will resolve or get smaller after six weeks. Occasionally, massive hemoperitoneum can result from a ruptured hemorrhagic cyst. Okay? What about the CT findings? Before rupture, there will be mixed attenuation mass with high internal attenuation component, up to 100 Hounsfield unit in the adnexia. Blood. Okay? Fluid fluid levels, hemoperitoneum may be observed after cyst rupture and contrast enhanced CT may delineate the cyst wall and delayed CT may be useful in demonstrating the site of the pooling of contrast enhanced blood in the pelvis. You can see the blood coming out of the rupture cyst and collecting in the pelvis if you take a delayed image. For example, you can see here, sorry, evidence of thick enhancing wall and some high density fluid within the pelvis this is blood this is not a normal this is normal urine normal fluid this is increased level then uh, increased density level okay see the Hounsfield is about five, 50 Hounsfield units again you can see here there is a fluid hematocrit level fluid RBC level okay and on the delayed slightly delayed images you can see the the blood the contrast enhanced blood pooling from the rupture cells into the pelvis you can see this is this is leaking blood you can detect it so you can confirm that this is a ruptured hemorrhagic cyst very important topic to know is the ovarian torsion it is it makes about 3% of gynecologic emergency emergencies and the fifth the fifth most common gynecologic surgical emergency usually it might involve the ovary the fallopian tube or both the tube ovarian torsion can result in partial or complete rotation of the ovary on its pedicle 
which contains the ovarian artery, ovarian branch of uterine artery, compromising first the lymphatic, then the venous, and finally the arterial flow, leading to hemorrhagic infarction. So the first thing to be affected is the lymphatic flow, then the venous, and the last thing is the arterial flow. Okay? You can see here, this is like the tube of ovarian torsion, and the ovary gets rotated on its axis, compromising its flow. Usually in women of reproductive age and that presents with acute onset of severe pelvic pain, more common on the right. It's afibrial with normal white BC, mild leukocytosis sometimes. Patients with high clinical suspicion work up proceeds with immediate Doppler ultrasound examination. Go directly to Doppler ultrasound. You will find ipsilateral adnexial mass. If the pain on the right, you will find the right adnexial mass. On the left, you will find left adnexial mass. Uh, sometimes you might find pregnancy and there will be ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. In patients are uh, fertile, uh, sorry, infertile, and she takes uh, ovarian stimulating drugs leading to enlargement of the ovary. The ovary become torted due to, as a result of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome or previous pelvic surgery like a tubal ligation, like supporting ligaments, especially in children. Up to 80% of patients have underlying ovarian mass, like dermoid, paratubal cyst, simple or hemorrhagic cyst, rarely malignancy. Once the ovary and anexian adult is more than 5 cm, it's prone to tors. If the ovary is more than 5 cm, there is a high likelihood of torsion. Okay? For any cause. Uh, what are the risk, factor, risk factors for ovarian torsion in a normal ovary, either lack supporting ligaments, redundant mesosarpings, tubal spasm, abrupt change in intra-abdominal pressure, like coughing, vomiting, and exercise? What will we see in ultrasound? You'll see an enlarged ovary, heterogeneous central stroma, secondary edema, infarction, peripheral cyst, and maybe quite amorphous there will be a typical midline position of the ovary. The ovary will you will see it in the midline, not in the right or the left side, okay? Check for underlying mass and you will see asymmetric thickening of as ovarian cyst wall with dilated tube forming what's called a target sign plus minus free fluid. We'll see several examples of that. Grayscale findings are most important and the appearance will be quite variable depending on the time and the degree of torsion. For example, you can see here, this, this ovary is large, it's heterogeneous, there are multiple peripheral cysts, sorry, multiple peripheral cysts, and can be amorphous, not, not significant, yani change, uh, the shape is not typical, it's not an, a normal ovary, it's large, it's heterogeneous, multiple peripheral follicles, it's avascular. You can see here, there, this ovary was enlarged and it was in the midline, okay? Check for underlying mass and there is a cyst here. This cyst might be the cause of the torsion. Cyst, large, uh, sorry, ovary, large, heterogeneous, amorphous, small amount of free fluid, it's in the midline, and it is avascular. With Doppler, you cannot see any, just like <coughs> testicular torsion, there is increased peripheral vascularity, no internal vascularity. Okay? The same idea. You can see here, this is the ovary, the tube, and the uterus. Free fluid here. The tube and the ovary are enlarged. This is what we call target sign. When the tube ovarian torsion, the tube rotates on its axis to result in target-like appearance. You can see circle within circle within circle here. This is what we call target sign. If there is an ovarian cyst, there will be asymmetric thickening of the cyst wall. You can see here, this is a thick wall of the cyst versus thin wall of the cyst. So asymmetric thickening. Lymphatic obstruction will, will happen first. The blood flow may be normal at this level. Then there will be decreased flow, reverse diastolic flow, decreased or absent venous flow, and the last thing is the complete absence of arterial flow. Okay, yeah, when you reach arterial, no arterial flow, this is the last stage of the ovarian torsion. On Doppler, the 
appearance will be variable depending on the time and on the degree of torsion the ovary has a dual blood supply via the, the ovarian artery and the uterine artery the torsion might be intermittent so what are the diagnostic findings are first complete absence of arterial flow color doppler will show whirlpool sign in the twisted pedicle we will see an example of it in a minute a normal doppler examination does not exclude ovarian torsion just like scrotal uh, testicular torsion normal doppler exam does not exclude testicular torsion okay the same thing you can see this ovary large heterogeneous echogenic peripheral cysts small amount of free fluid and with doppler there is absolutely no flow okay you can see some with power doppler there's just faint areas of very minimal vascularity indicating incomplete torsion okay again on doppler flow there is nothing absolutely nothing so what do we see here this is the whirlpool sign you can see the target sign of the tube it is rotated on its axis and with the doppler exam this is the ovary and here you see the blood vessels are whirlpool just like uh, this is the whirlpool okay again you can see it it's rotating on its axis the appearance might be variable ovary large peripheral follicles echogenic there might be a cyst with asymmetric wall thickening it's thicker here than here you might see blood flow however this is a high resistance pattern indicating increased resistance for the blood flow on the MRI you can see this large ovary this edematous marked edematous trauma due to infarction or ischemia and with uh, fluid free fluid in the pelvis so absence of arterial waveforms or high resistance to arterial flow with absent venous flow are highly suggestive of ovarian torsion particularly when those findings are accompanied with ovarian enlargement however the converse does not hold true yani if there is ovarian enlargement not always you'll have absent flow if you suspect ovarian torsion in a female for any cause you do an ultrasound you see an enlarged ovary on the ipsilateral side you go for doppler study if you don't see arterial flow or decreased arterial flow what you should do you look for venous flow if you don't see venous flow this is in favor of torsion the venous flow will disappear before the arterial flow try to look not for only for the arterial you look for the venous if you see venous torsion is a little bit suspicious if you see venous if you don't see venous look for the arterial if you don't see arterial this is torsion if you saw arterial again might be torsion might be not torsion however if it is torsion it is incomplete يعني ما فتنا مرحلة we did not reach the part of ischemic ovary infarcted ovary there is some arterial flow still okay look for venous flow if you don't see it look for arterial flow okay if you see venous flow this is very unlikely to be torsion so normal arterial waveforms do not rule out torsion just like we said the venous are much more sensitive than arterial okay however means the ovary is still viable yeah, it can be you can have a ovarian torsion with present arterial flow what does this mean means incomplete torsion the ovary is still viable okay if the MRI is equivocal consider uh, if the ultrasound is equivocal consider MR imaging for example you can see this ovary it appears like torted ovary heterogeneous large peripheral however with Doppler there are some internal vascularity you can see here arterial flow no venous but there is arterial flow so this might indicate early torsion so when we did an MRI there is a large midline ovary peripheral displaced follicles with a bright central stroma small amount of free fluid this is in favor of ovarian torsion again inject contrast and there is no contrast enhancement no post contrast you can see contrast in the arteries and veins here but the ovary 
relatively there is no contrast and there is a thick fallopian tube confirming that this is an ovarian torsion on the CT scan there will be a large midline ovary with peripheral cyst and a thickened pedicle this is the pedicle it's here thick and this is the ovary large okay again you can see peripheral cyst thick tubes and this fat surrounding fat is stranded and edematous this is the ovary large and this is the tube thickened and convoluted okay again there is twisted left over uh, this has 16 year old she, she has uh, an cyst in the ovary in the left ovary okay and the ovary uh, the, is twisted because of the cyst the cyst is large making the ovary prone to torsion you can see here the ovary is large edematous stranded surrounding fat planes small amount of free fluid in the pelvis indicating ovarian torsion this case was sister adenoma 23 year old postpartum woman presented with fever first before uh, torsion she had uh, left pelvic mass CT was done and the mass was a cyst septated cyst because it's a cyst adenoma okay and then suddenly she developed an abdominal pain they went and examined her and the mass shifted from the left to the right cross the midline why because it's torted the big mass crossed the midline turned the ovary on its axis okay lack of contrast enhancement and free fluid uh, free pelvic fluid and hematoma you can see here pre-contrast and post-contrast there is no contrast enhancement in the ovary so as a conclusion the ovarian torsion don't be uh, Mis under misguided by the history not all patients with ovarian torsion present with severe abdominal pain focus on grayscale imaging features of enlarged ovary heterogeneous central stroma peripheral cyst abnormal midline location and adjacent thick pedicle plus minus target sign okay on doppler look for absence of flow abnormal flow and whirlpool sign don't be uh, dis dissuaded by the presence of a flow this might be might be a good thing if you see a flow don't exclude torsion there might be torsion and this can be a good thing okay look for similar findings on ct use mr as a problem solver only ct findings are similar including enlarged midline non-enhancing ovary with thick adjacent tube consider referral to mri if ultrasound or ct findings are not diagnostic easier to see twisted pedicle and increased signal intensity of central ovarian stroma and peripheral displacement of the follicles uh, regarding endometriomas functional endometrial glands located outside the endometrium and the myometrium this is the all of us we know that is 10 percent of premenopausal women and can be reactivated on postmenopausal on hormone replacement therapy 80 percent are within the ovaries extra ovarian like serosal of the uterus on the urinary bladder ureters fallopian tubes intestinal tract they might present with secondary rupture or infection as an, uh, of an endometrioma may lead to acute presentation but such occurrences are uncommon usual endometriosis results in cyclic pain not acute pain imaging features of ultrasound is 83 percent sensitive 89 percent specific there will be a complex cystic mass uniform low level ecogenicity repeated episodes of cyclic bleeding respond to corresponds to chocolate cyst at gross examination large endometriomas, endometriomas may be depicted as multiple adjoining cystic structures less frequently they appear solid for example you can see this cyst here with with low level echoes inside due to repeated episodes of bleeding with each menstrual cycle on CT scan, it's not non-specific. There will be variable appearance: solid, cystic, heterogeneous, adnexial masses. Margins may be irregular. Internal regions of low attenuation due to cyclic episodes of bleeding. Bleeding of different ages, blood of different ages. <coughs> okay, you can see here this different densities of fluid within the cyst due to the current episodes of bleeding. Again. This is an endometrial with hemorrhagic component. You can see this cyst heterogeneous with multiple different echoes and small amount of free fluid in the pelvis. Again, 
This is uh, presented uh, with right lower quadrant pain. Endometriosis causes obstruction of the appendix. This was the cyst. It was on the right side, close to the appendix. And with the next slice, you can see there is a thick enhancing appendix. So this is appendicitis as a cause of, again, the obstruction is caused by the endometriomas, not by appendi by appen an appendicolith. Okay? There's no appendicolith. This is an endometriosis at the site of surgical scar. Previous cesarean section results. This is a common presentation, actually. You will see it a lot. Endometriosis at the site of a surgical scar. On MRI, if the ultrasound is equivocal or for further evaluation, you can, the MRI can detect superficial peritoneal implants, extra peritoneal lesions like in the rectovaginal space, ureter uterosacral space, Endometrioma has a high signal on T1 weighted images, which does not suppress with fat saturated images because the blood products are, are of different ages. Okay, so you can see here this is a T1 image with a high level, high T1 signal intensity on fat saturated. There is no suppression of the signal intensity, confirming this is a blood. Okay, on T2, there is decreased signal intensity again due to blood of different ages. Again, the same thing. On T1, it's high signal intensity, no loss, of, no loss of signal on fast saturated images. On T2, you can see the blood fluid level, and there's a fibroid here in the uterus. PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, it's usually an acute ascending infection, can extend to the uterus, tubes, ovaries, pelvic peritoneum, caused by Neisseria gonorrhea, chlamydia, co-infection with other bacteria, typically after or during menses presenting. Uh, with lower abdominal pain, pelvic pain, vaginal discharge, fever, nausea, vomiting, malaise, leukocytosis, just like any normal infection, fever and leukocytosis and pain, okay? Presents with cervical motion tenderness, bilateral axial tenderness, purulent cervical discharge. You see here, there is indistinct thick endometrial stripe, okay? Again, endometriosis, endometrial stripe is thick, irregular, contains a gas bubble here, Congested vascular uterus, okay. Early sonographic signs, uh, if it reaches the ovary, there will be acute ophritis. The ovary is enlarged, multiple small follicles, in ill-defined outer margin, acute salpingitis resulting in swollen fallopian tubes with thick mucosal folds. Tube is now readily visualized, separate from the ovary. You can see here, the ov the tube is very obvious. It's thick. It's vascular. It's edematous because salpingitis, okay? And the ovary is enlarged salpingitis and oophritis. Again, you can see here the ovary is large, uh, the, sorry, the tube is large, thick, edematous, and hypervascular, okay? This is an acute PID present progressing to pile salpings. It was a pelvic inflammatory disease progressed to what? To fluid within the fallopian tube, confirming this is a pyosalpings, okay? By Doppler, there is hyperemia of the tube. You can see this is the tube containing fluid with debris level. This is the tube, contains fluid, and the fluid is dirty. It's not clear, indicating this is a pyosalpings. You can see here, sorry, this is increased vascularity in the wall of this markedly dilated tube containing echogenic fluid and you can see fluid fluid level this level here due to pyosalpings this is what we call a cogwheel appearance you can see th you can see thick blunted mucosal folds like here and here these are mucosal folds that are edematous thick in confirming pyosalpings again you can see cogwheel appearance thick blunted mucosal folds like here and here and here okay again you can see it here this is the cogwheel appearance waist sign uh, due to change in the diameter of the tube from the between the fimbriated end and the relatively more uh, becomes more dilated like here you can see this a waist here between the tube and the fimbriated end again tube and the fimbriated end there is a waist narrowing Again, a sign of biosalpings or salpingitis in general. Incomplete septation sign, it's just like the small bowel when there is uh, the uh, 
folds, the, the intestinal folds are incomplete. Here also, you can see incomplete septations because the tube is uh, يعني, tortuous, becomes tortuous. Again, tube ovarian abscess ultrasound finding will show ovary that is large and there will be a complex cystic structure with thick walled mass and internal echoes confirming tubo ovarian abscess okay again you can see here this mass is large heterogeneous thick wall uh, there will be increased vascularity increased tenderness and usually it's bilateral you can see the increased vascularity within the wall of the tube you can see here the tubo ovarian abscess appears as a complex heterogeneous mass okay <coughs> the ovarian margins are relatively spared okay in the uterus there will be serocytes the serosal surface of the uterus becomes more prominent and hypoechoic and it delineates the uterus okay Ecogenic pelvic fat due to edema, stranding of the pelvic fat. You can see here the pelvic fat is more ecogenic than usual due to serocytes of the covering of the uterus. Again, here you can see this uterus is heterogeneous and increased ecogenicity of the surrounding fat and increased appearance, yani more obvious looking serosa. The serosa is inflamed, edematous. So, in conclusion, Commonly, you will find a complex tender bilateral anexial masses and look for uterine serocytes, ecogenic pelvic fat, and dilated tubes. These are in, uh, yani signs of pelvic inflammatory disease as a cause of acute pelvic pain. On CT, there will be stranding of the parapelvic fat. It is common, but it's not specific, of course. And there will be thickening of the uterosacral ligament. In case of tubo ovarian abscess, there will be complex fluid attenuation collections with thick and irregular enhancing walls with anterior displacement of the broad ligament there will be internal gas bubbles it's very specific radiologic sign but not always up present of course but are unusual in tubo ovarian abscess you can see here this is obviously an abscess thick wall heterogeneous contents and by CT scan you can see both tubes are dilated fluid fold stranded fat planes and obviously bilateral tubo ovarian abscess again here you can see here fluid to fluid level within a complex thick walled cyst and the same thing you see by CT thick walled enhancing cyst with heterogeneous uh, uh, stranded surrounding fat planes uterine disorders quickly uh, it's the most readily associated with endovaginal ultrasound it varies according to the stage of the menstrual cycle the endometrium will reach up to 18 millimeter during the secretory phase on CT the endometrium has a low attenuation than the adjusted myometrium you can see this is a normal endometrium it has a low at lower attenuation than the myometrium however it is higher than uh, the urinary bladder higher than fluid fibroids are very common it's over 20 to 50 percent of women over the age of 30 they have fibroids they are estrogen dependent they enlarge during elevated estrogen level like first trimester of pregnancy usually fibroids enlarge and diminish in size after menopause what's going on mm. sorry intramural fibroids they are confined to the myometrium like this one here you have submucosal fibroids that are bulges into the endometrial cavity and you have subserosal fibroids that are bulge on the outside on the out external surface of the uterus these are the different types of the fibroids intramural are much more common than subserosal and submucosal fibroids so the location its relationship to the endometrial cavity are important considerations in cases of infertility fibroids they alter the contour the shape of the uterus if they are in the uterine cavity if they are, if they are submucosal may affect the ability of embryo uh, implantation Subserosal and submucosal fibroids may become pedunculated, may undergo torsion. If they undergo torsion, there will be infarction, degeneration, necrosis, infection, and they will be a cause of acute pelvic pain. Usually, mostly are asymptomatic. Symptoms can include menorrhagia, pain, urinary 
complaints if it's compressing on the urinary bladder and infertility. Pelvic pain in fibroids, if there's been a degeneration, if they're out to grow their blood supply, they take a lot of, uh, they become large and the blood is not enough. Okay, resulting in pain in 30% of cases. Hemorrhage will cause red degeneration. Torsion if in, will occur in pedunculated fibroids. Compression of the adjacent structure might cause also pain. Hyaline degeneration is most commonly secondary change in the fibroids and may be accompanied by varying degree of liquefaction. If they outgrow, their blood supply will go into hyaline degeneration. Okay? Hyaline degeneration, there will be more cystic appearance. For example, ultrasound is the study of choice. Echogenic mass, if fibrosis prevails. Hypoechoic, if muscle component prevails. So it can be hyperechoic or hypoechoic, according to the histopathologic composition of the, of the fibroid. Usually they give sharp shadows, any echoic if central portion of the fibroid has degenerated. For example, here you can see this, an intramural fibroid within the uterus. You can see this is the endometrial stripe and this is the fibroid. Again, you can see the fibroid here appears as a hypoechoic lesion. And this is the endometrial stripe. Another submucosal fibroid. This is the endometrial stripe. It's compressed by this fibroid, changing its shape. And this uh, ultrasound of a sonohistogram shows a large fibroid in the cavity. The saline or fluid is injected in the endometrial cavity, and you can see this large fibroid. It's intramural submucosal. It's changing the shape of the endometrial cavity. Again, you can see here, this is the fibroid. Again, this is a subserosal fibroid here. You can see the fibroid hypoechoic on the external surface, not affecting the endometrial cavity. Okay. This also is another anterior submucosal fibroid bulging on the urinary bladder. So, exophytic fibroid projecting into the broad ligament. This might be confusing. Is this a fibroid? This is the uterus. This is a far away fibroid. How to confirm that? You should change for other modality to confirm that this fibroid is somehow connected to the uterus. Okay? Subserosal may be confused with adnexial masses. MR imaging can help confirm the uterine rather than adnexial origin. The MRI may demonstrate normal ovaries, not visualized at ultrasound. When you do an MRI, you see normal ovary, then this mass is not ovarian in origin. Okay? MRI imaging may help to confirm that the mass is a fibroid by demonstrating characteristic low signal intensity or a feeding vessel on T2-weighted images. For example, you can see here, this is a large mass. On ultrasound, may be confused. Where is the origin? On the MRI, you can see it's a serosal. It is attached to the uterus. Again, there is a hyperechoic fibroid here. Again, hyperechoic fibroid. This was a lipolyomyoma, not a pure lyomyoma because it's hyperechoic. This is Marxistic degeneration of the fibroid. You can see it's hypoechoic. Again, this uh, fibroid has some calcific component. This is fibroid with peripheral calcification. We see this a lot, I think, during our practice. Again, some spots of calcification within the fibroid. Pseudocapsule compressed surrounding the myometrium. You can see here, this is, all of this is a fibroid, okay? And this is just a myometrium compressed by the fibroid appearing as a pseudocapsule. All of this is a fibroid, okay? Again, lyomyosarcoma, it's rare, less than 1% as a, a malignant degeneration of a ly uh, into lyomyosarcoma. Yani, uh, fibroids can go into malignant degeneration as a lyomyosarcoma, but it's very rare. Okay? You can see this was a hypoechoic fibroid and with cystic degeneration. After a while, there is a nodule within the cystic component of the fibroid indicating its degeneration into lyomyosarcoma. This nodule was not present. On the CT scan, it's, they are incidental, most of them. Uterine enlargement, associated focal masses, most common finding on CT. They, of enhancement is often heterogeneous, mixed density, low attenuation suggests internal degeneration, higher attenuation if calcification or hemorrhage present. Solid mass type calcification and uterine mass is are the most specific sign for lyomyoma. However, 
they occur only in 10%. Yani 10% of the leiomyomas shows marked calcification. Okay? You can see here this uh, leiomyoma, this fibroid here projecting. It's just like a soft tissue. You can see here's heterogeneous mass arising from the uterus. They look worrisome. However, they are just a degenerated fibroid, nothing more. You can see the endometrial stripe on the ultrasound, and this large mass here, again, this is the endometrial stripe, and this mass here is a degenerated fibroid, nothing else. This appears large mass. At the beginning, they did not know what is the origin of the mass. When they opened, it was just a large degenerated fibroid. This all was blood pushing all the abdominal content posteriorly and some soft tissue component, it looks worrisome. However, it was benign fibroid with degeneration and internal hemorrhage. So it can be large, can show hemorrhage. Some calcific fossae within the fibroid. This was pelvic pain, presented with pelvic pain. It was just an ovarian, uh, sorry, a uterine fibroid. Adenomyosis is another condition that might cause uh, Pain, pelvic pain, it's endometrial gland within the myometrium. 11% have endometriosis. Imaging findings include a large globular uterus, some cystic areas, occasionally enlarged globular uterus with small myometrial cyst, maybe visualized as CT. At MRI, it's very uh, obvious as a diffuse focal thickening of the junctional zone more than 12 millimeter. You can see here this endometrial stripe, and the uterus is enlarged and heterogeneous, indicating adenomyosis. Again, you can see here fossa of endometrium within the myometrium, which the myometrium is large and the uterus is bulky. On the ultrasound appearance, you can see this indicates adenomyosis. Again, there is an ovarian cyst here. Okay? You can see here, this is the junctional zone, hypo-intense, and peripheral myometrium shows fossa of hyperintensity. On T2, this is the normal appearance. Okay? You can see here, this is thick junctional zone, some free fluid here. While here you can see bulky uterus, multiple foci of hyperintensity within the uterus indicating adenomyosis. Okay? Ectopic pregnancy is a very important thing to exclude. It has medical legal uh, consequences and life-threatening condition. Okay? More common in women with tubal ligation, intrauterine devices removed, previous for uh, intrauterine de device for contraceptions, history of sexually transmitted disease, infertility agents, they increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy. Consider ectopic pregnancy in all women with abdominal pain and, and or vaginal bleeding and positive pregnancy test. Any woman has a pelvic pain with positive pregnancy test, plus minus bleeding, think of ectopic pregnancy. Very important, never forget it, okay? Up to 50% of women with ectopic pregnancy are asymptomatic, okay? These are the different types of common areas of uh, ectopic implants. The most common are ampullary, about 80%. Unfortunately, Taman. Consider ectopic pregnancy in all women with positive pregnancy test in which the intrauterine pregnancy is not visualized. Most ectopics are in the fallopian tube, may have multiple ultrasound presentation, most commonly are empty uterus, plus minus free fluid, bagel sign, we'll see it in a moment, tubal ring sign with thickened fallopian tube. On the Doppler exam, you'll see what's called a ring of fire appearance, hemosalpings, live ectopic with fetal pole, plus minus heartbeat may be see also. You can see here, pseudo gestational sac, it's irregular and it's empty, here and here, okay? There's no double decidual sac sign. What do we mean? This is the double decidual sac. There is the chorion and the decidua vera, okay? Double decidual sac sign, this is, it indicates normal pregnancy. If you don't see it, just one decidual sac, it's suspicious for ectopic pregnancy, okay? You can see decidual, decidual may fragment into the endometrial canal, may make an embryo. You can see here, you think this is a decidual, a gestational sac, and this is a fetal pole? No, this is just a fragmented decidua. Okay, be careful. Again, you can see no evidence of trophoblastic flow. This is a gestational sac. The flow is in the uterus, in the myometrium, not in the trophoblast. This is a very diagnostic appearance. There is a fetal pole outside the uterus. 
you don't need further discussion. There's heartbeat, yolk sac, everything, but they are outside the uterus. Again here, you can see a yolk sac, a yolk sac appearance, it's outside the uterus on the ovary, this is the ovary, indicating an ectopic pregnancy. Again here, the same appearance. So, high uh, tubal ring sign is a highly likely finding of ectopic pregnancy. You can see echogenic separate from the ovary plus minus vascular rim and located between the ovary and the uterus. Okay? This is, this is it. This is it. This is the appearance of a tubal ring sign. This is a bagel sign also they call it. Okay? Just like a bagel. Ring of fire appearance on Doppler study. Okay? So an ultrasound finding, you look for extrauterine gestational sac with yolk sac, embryo, mass, large amount of free fluid, adnexial hematoma, pelvic pain, pain and fluid and mass with different sensitivities and specificity. And this will be the causes of acute pelvic pain in non-pregnant premenopausal women. And they are very common. Almost every day we see several cases of acute pelvic pain in young women. We should be careful, especially for ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy must be excluded. If you have a young woman married with pelvic pain, ask for a pregnancy test first, then do the ultrasound. If she has a pregnancy test, see it, then do the ultrasound. Because if you miss an ectopic pregnancy, she will go into a life-threatening condition, the tube might rupture, she might bleed to death, okay? If she make it to the hospital, she will lose a tube, she might become infertile, and you all might face a lawsuit. Be careful of ectopic pregnancy. All the rest can be managed, no problem. But ectopic pregnancy, very important to exclude. Ask for a transvaginal ultrasound if you are not sure. Okay? Any questions? Thank you very much, guys.